Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this talk about functional programming and web applications. Uh, web application in this context, in the context of this talk, is on the server side. Uh, you can do cli client side ap web applications with F as well, with a product called Fable, but that's out of scope for this uh, talk. Um, but if you're interested in that, you can just talk to me afterwards and I can show you the, the right directions. Um, before going any further, how many of you know F Sharp? Almost like half. And how many of you, you know uh, Suave? Like 10, something like that. Okay, that's good. Good to know. Uh, my name is Thomas Jansson. It's on Twitter handle, handle there. So if you have any questions afterwards, you can just ping me and I try to answer as fast as possible. And you can also like, raise your hand during the talk and I try to answer questions during the talk as well. Um, I work here in Oslo at a company called uh, Beck, um, where I'm a manager, but that's just a label. <laughs> I consider myself to be, be a developer, as most of you guys. Uh, I'm also the practice lead of those net group at Beck, and um, yeah, that's what we do, basically. Uh, my customer I work for is in the public sector, so we I was here last year talking where I said I want to do like 90% F-sharp programming in, in 2016. Uh, that didn't happen. I may be up to like 35, 40%. <laughs> uh, but it's a long process to take uh, like a whole customer over to, to F-sharp. And we have one project that's 100% F-sharp and we're trying to bring in bits and pieces to, to other solutions solution as well. Uh, when I'm not working or relaxing at home, I'm also the lead of .NET user group here in Oslo, and also the initiator of the Oslo F# -Sharp group here in Oslo. So if you want, if you live in Oslo, there's a meetup for you here. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft MVP and a, a F# -Sharp enthusiast, at the least. So, what is F# -Sharp and why should you care? Uh, the first part of that. The question is quite easy to answer. Uh, F-sharp is something that came out of Microsoft Research, but now maintained by the F-sharp Foundation. Uh, it's a totally open source project, so everyone can contribute to, to F-sharp. Uh, F-sharp, so it's not like .NET, where Microsoft is actually uh, owning the repository. It's, uh, it's a foundation that owns the F-sharp repository. Uh, it's a functional first language based on the ML uh, language tree, and it runs well on the .NET platform. Uh, with that, it means both on the CLR, Mono, and also on .NET Core. Uh, .NET Core is still on the like .NET Core is not ready yet, so it will will work on .NET Core when it's ready. So that's what F# -sharp is. So the other part of the question is why should you consider F# -sharp? I'm going to have like a really short uh, introduction to why you should before going to the demos. Uh, F-sharp has a really strong and solid foundation. Uh, I compare it usually to, to C-sharp when I'm, I'm talking about this. And, and one of the th first thing is that it's really strong typing compared to, to C-sharp, which means that it's, if it compiles, compiles, it most likely run. Uh, but that doesn't mean you don't have, have ever errors. Of course, you can have errors in your application, but you don't have any like stupid errors, at least. The next thing is it doesn't have any null support. Well, it has null support because you have to do it on the .NET, but default, you don't use null in F Sharp. And Tony Ware, who introduced null in Algol in 65, called that his billion dollar mistake. And, and if you start to think about null, it's really hard to reason about it. They take a regular C sharp list, for example. <laughs> what does null mean for a list? Is the list empty, or did the method return the list fail, or wh wh what's, what does it mean? And that makes it hard for, for a developer to actually reason about that. And if you want to use null in, in F sharp, you instead use a thing called option, uh, which specifies that this can be a null, and it's much, much more explicit. The next thing about uh, making a solid, solid foundation is it's immutable by default. And that also makes it much easier to reason about the code. 
because you don't change the state all the time. Instead, you just copy the state to a new variable. Uh, that might sound like it's really expensive, but uh, there are really smart things in the compiler, and so, so it's not that expensive sound. Of course, when you need to do like really hardcore performance uh, improvements, then you might need to do use some mutability. And Ashrop has support for mutability as well, but it's not default. Or it's not how you should do it if you do it correctly. Um, and there's also really good uh, syntax support to, for example, set properties on a data structure. Uh, the next thing is structural equality. Compared to C-sharp, where it's only referen refer referential equality, uh, structural equality compares all the values inside the uh, data structure or object or what you like. And that, that makes it much more easier to, <laughs> to know what equals mean. Uh, if you're doing a like equals in, in C-sharp, you basically, basically need to know how is the equals method implemented for that object to know what that actually means. Uh, and this is as long as you use the F-sharp types that's defined in F-sharp and, and not using any C-sharp types. The next thing is composability. This is one of the most important concepts in F-sharp. Um, you can compose both types and functions really easy. And that can take you from this mess of Lego bricks to at least nice, terrifying Death Star. Uh, the thing is, you, you can compose basically anything in most <laughs> languages, but the question is how easy it is to compose things. And in F sharp, it's really easy just to create simple small types and put types together to make a whole data structure. And it's also easy to compose functions together with tiny small functions together with uh, small uh, composition functions. I'm going to see some examples of this later in the, in the demo. Uh, and you don't need any boilerplate to actually do a lot of this work. Uh, the next thing is the feedback. And when I mean feedback, I mean it in three different levels. The first one is actually like a social level. The ecosystem in, in F Sharp is really amazing. Uh, it's a lot of open source projects. The community is really welcoming and, and helpful. And there are like super smart guys. and. And if you ask a question on Slack, Twitter, or wherever, you always get an answer quite fast. The next level of feedback is when you actually start sitting down in code. Then you have this uh, REPL, read, evaluate, print loop, which makes it easy for you to prototype things and try things out really fast. And that's also a concept that's actually C sharp. It's not a concept from, from F sharp, but C sharp has, has also an, an uh, REPL now, which is not as powerful, I guess. It's a bit nice, it's a bit more colorful at the moment, but, but F-sharp has had this since day one, basically. And the last part of feedback is testing. Of course, you can do testing in C-sharp uh, and other languages, but when you're using a functional language, you use the structure of code differently. So that makes it easier to test the code, and that way you get better feedback, I think. And that's at least my experience of y using a functional language. So the next part is F-sharp functional language and the web. That sounds a little bit odd, but we'll see that about that uh, <laughs> later. Uh, I would like to say that uh, all applications are functions. And that means that web applications also are functions. Um, but what, what do I mean with this? Does anyone agree or disagree? <laughs> no one. Um, so let us think about the mental model of how most people see, uh, look at a web application. Of course, you can divide this server box into multiple layers and uh, factories and providers and controllers, etc. But, but if you look at it in a black box, you should have a request and response, and you have something in, in the middle, basically. So let's move around the arrows a little bit. Uh, now we start switching the mental model from you have a request, you throw it in the server, and now come response. The, the one that's making the request could easily be the same one consuming the response, 
but now we have some different side. And this is actually exactly what a function is. And this is most like how most lang uh, most applications work. And we see it like quite often now with all the JavaScript framework coming out, like adapting this model, like React and things like that. So so yes, yeah, so, so if you start thinking about what is an application, the output here can be write to a database or show some HTML or whatever. So so th this applies basically to all applications as I see it. Um, and that brings us to the last part. I'm going to have a lot of demos, or hopefully if they work. Um, but first, I want to cover the last part, and that's Suave. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a project started by another Swedish guy uh, called Henrik Felt. And, uh, it is a really super light web framework implemented in F Sharp for F Sharp. And it, uh, as I said, lightweight non blocking. And it also runs on Linux, OS X, and Windows. Uh, and that's just, it runs on all platforms. That's because it's F Sharp, and F Sharp runs on Mono, so that doesn't run on, on all those platforms. Uh, I've tried it on both Windows and Mono, and it's no problem at all. I also tried it a little bit in .NET Core, but just firing up Hello World, basically. Uh, so I will work on, on .NET Core when it's ready. They have some alpha bits that's running on .NET Core. I won't show that today, but uh, they have, they're working on it. Um, and you, you can actually program web application using ASP.NET and F Sharp as well. But the reason why you should care about Suave is Suave is a framework implemented for F Sharp, which make it much easier to use uh, idiomatic F Sharp when you are make programming the web applications. So let's go into detail what uh, Suave is. I see Suave as three concepts. The whole HTTP context, something called a web part, and then we have uh, combinators. So the first part, which is the HTTP context, that's basically just your request and response object, which a bake, or, and also headers and everything that has to do with a request and response, that's something they have encapsulated in this data structure called HTTP context. And that was passed along through a series of different steps. And all those steps are web parts. And web parts, have a function signature that looks something like this. It takes an HTTP context and out comes a <laughs> async computation expression with a maybe an HTTP context. It might not return an HTTP context, it might return none instead of some HTTP context. And th this makes it really easy to compose web parts together in, in different ways, as we're going to see later. And to compose things that put together, we have combinators. And these, comp these have basically two flavors. This one that creates web parts from primitive values, making like take a string and create a web part from a string, or take a function, lifting up to create a web part from that function. Uh, and also has one that takes multiple web parts and creates a single web part. Uh, see, everything here is a web part. And that makes it also easy to, to compose and, and extend, and, uh, extend the, the applications. So the model, how it basically works, is first you start with some functions or values. This is like a bottom-up approach of how it works. Then you apply a combinator on that function or values to create uh, one or more, more web parts. Uh, and when you have multiple web parts, you can use another uh, combinator to create a um, new web part. And that's, this is basically all there is to it. And of course, you can plug in more web parts in other web parts and things like that. So, so this is really flexible and really nice architecture to work with. And you can wrap this web application to uh, another uh, combinator to apply some cross-cutting concerns. 
I think that's basically all I have about slides today because I want to show the code instead and see how it works. Any questions so far? Then uh, let's go to the demo. And before the demo, I also have um, two other products that you might see during the, the, <laughs> the demo. I won't talk about them, but they're really awesome, both for C Sharp developers and F Sharp developers. It's called Packet, which is a packet manager that using the NuGet format, but it's not resolving the package references the same way as Packet, as, uh, as NuGet. And then we also have Fake, which is a build tool for uh, basically anything. Um, and that's something we, we use both of these tools in, in my project. Um, yeah, so that's all I have about slides to start with. So let's go to uh, the demo. Uh, I thought I'm going to do this. Uh, you, you can run F Sharp as scripts, and you can also run F Sharp as a uh, compiled application. And since this is just prototyping, I want to show how things work quite fast. Then I thought scripting would be nice. So I'm going to do everything as F Sharp the scripts. Uh, and the first thing we need to do to get started with, with uh, F Sharp is to uh, add Suave to our um, solution, if you like. Uh, I'm using the <laughs> alphabet because I'm hardcore. Um, I, I, this actually, uh, I, I submitted a, a pull request for one small function that I needed for a thing, and that's why I'm using the alphabets. Uh, I could almost as use the regular one of bits. Uh, and this is uh, how you define um, NuGet references in, in Paket. And to install, uh, this we need to run the packet install. Now it's just pulling down the Java bits. That's basically the same thing as uh, NuGet install. But the the good part with this is that I now don't have any version uh, number in the path to um, to the DLL. So if I upgrade Suave, everything will still work without me need to update all the references. And then to just uh, create a hello world, we first need to open the Suave module, and then we can just start web server with the default uh, Suave, uh, Suave configuration. Uh, this is where you, you can apply your own configuration or extend this one to provide ports and host name, et cetera. But I'm just going to use the default the configuration. Uh, this doesn't compile. So I need to add a successful thing. That's to get this OK here to OK is a combinator that takes a string as input and creates a new web part. So this is basically all there is to it, hopefully. To uh, get started. And th this is that not Chrome. Here is Chrome. The local host, I think, what, 83, right? So that worked. And that's this. Is, this is one of the most beautiful things about Suave, I think, compared to, for example, ASP.NET. I don't think you can write uh, maybe like three lines, four lines of code, depending on how if you count the first one and create a, a, a Hello World application in ASP.NET, for example. So it's really low barrier to get started, and it's really easy to, to build on top of this. And that's what we're going to do uh, now. So let's put this in a own uh, variable. Let's call that Hello. We're going to have a lot of Hello things, and uh, instead call this app. And let the app look hello too. And now we're going, I'm going to implement a, a web part from scratch to show you there's not that much magic going on behind this uh, OK keyword here. So if you remember, remember from the slides, the signature of a web part looks something like this. Mm. Uh, 
So this means we take, yeah, I think, the one more, one too many context that's more like it. So to create a web part, we need something that takes a context as input. So let's take context input. Hello, now, hello to now take a context. I don't really care what context is. Uh, and now I'm going to cheat. I have some snippets, so I don't have to uh, uh, do some stupid mistakes. And this is basically all you need to do to create a web part. And this is a, is a async uh, return type. We need to wrap this in an async block. That's the first thing. And then we just create a new uh, string and take the bytes out from that string and add that to the uh, response type, the response object here. And then we just update the context uh, with that response and returning some. And we're returning some context means that this web part actually executed. If it returned none, then this web part will be skipped. So if we now, then we also set that app is equal to hello2, and then we just running uh, app, which means we now should go hello, get hello world instead of hello and the C. So let's do that. And that worked as expected. Any questions so far? Quite clear. That's good. Uh, what? What is the keyword? Here, uh, this is basically taking the. Um, uh, let me do it like this. Let instead to make it easy to see. So here we're actually taking the, the context that was input, and we take that context, make a new copy of it, but set the response uh, property on that context to be equal to the new response which we created over here. And we do the same thing for the response. We take the response from the context and update the content property from that response and create a new response. The question was, uh, yeah, how, 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 what width in, in F sharp is. Uh, I actually think there might be some similar syntax coming for uh, C sharp in the next version as well, because they're going to do, uh, they, they are working on getting some more immutable structures into C sharp inspired by this. Um, as you see, I'm, I'm switching back and forth between this. Uh, uh, console here, and that's sort of annoying. So I'm going to cheat a little bit to don't, so I don't have to um, restart the server every single time I do a change. So let's install um, fake, which is the, um, the build automation tool I talked about earlier. And we also need a compiler service. And then I, just, then I have prepared a Small, or I haven't prepared this. I copied this from uh, Thomas Petrusek, who is a, a really awesome uh, F# developer, uh, which basically listen on my file changes and reload the server every time, so I don't have to uh, restart the server manually. And I think we're now going to run on uh, uh, yeah, 8033. Here you actually see also the server stuff how you update the configuration if you need, want to use another configuration for, for Suave. Uh, but this is sort of out of scope of this talk, but there's no magic going on. And if you're interested in this script, I can point you to it. Uh, before I can run that, I need to um, uh, install the package as added to, to um, packet.dependencies. And uh, there's support for that in Atom, which I'm using. Uh, through the INI project. So I both have, uh, now I both have packet integration and I can also use fake directly. So that spawn thing is a target in my fake uh, project, which now I'm going to uh, create a new, and that won't work, I'm pretty sure, uh, because I first have to, let's stop that right away. I need to comment thing, this thing out because not, now my build script is starting a server, so I, want to, I don't want to start a server twice. So now it should work. And this 
turns. Yeah, so now it works. You start up the browser for me as well. Uh, okay, but this is not as good because I can also go to this address and it would sort of work. So how do I um, limit myself to just, uh, how do I apply routing to in Suave? So that's the next step. Um, let's continue with this hello uh, part. Uh, and to apply routing in, in Suave, you, use a, you combinate a call path. Uh, it tells me an error right now, but we're gonna fix that. Uh, and let's go to hello too. And the, the path combinator takes a string and returns a new web part. Uh, and to combine two web parts together, you use this fishbone operator. Um, and to add those two in scope, you see I have uh, some red squiggly lines here. We need to add the path operator and they are in the, op in the suave dot filters module. And now I get a new error because the fishbone operator is not there. And that is in open Suave. So I think it's operators, yeah. So basically what this does is if my request matches hello2, then run the path, or then run uh, the combinator, or the, the web part which I combine with this uh, path hello2 web part. So if you try this, I still would get, now we'll get some server error. That's uh, as expected, expected. Hello two, now returns, hello world. Okay, that's good. Um, but now the next step is I want to have multiple uh, paths. You see, I will also want to support uh, this, of course. Hello one. And to do that, you use another combinator called choose which basically takes a list of web part and executes the first one that returns sum. And if we try that now, we should have still hello too. Should be able to go to hello, but this shouldn't work. That's also as expected. So now we have like the really basic routing going on. Uh, the next step would be to add the parameters to the routes. And um, to do that, you use something called a passcan operator or combinator. And we use hello3, which we don't have yet. And then we just use uh, string formatting rules in F sharp to specify what the parameters in the URL should be. So this is going to match anything that has a load three to start with, and then followed by a string, followed by an integer. And this co uh, combinator takes another web part as input. Here I don't combine them together, instead this path can take uh, a web part as input. Well, not actually a web part, it actually takes a function that returns a web part as input. And that function must uh, support this, these two variables here. And here I have the message, and let's call it index. And now I just return, okay, okay, int f, hello. Let's move that. So there's nothing magic going here. Uh, lo 3 takes a message and index that matches those two parameters here. And then I just print out those to uh, into yeah to the uh, response stream. And if we run this, I hope this should work. Hello three. Yeah, that worked nice. So th this is this is almost as, as advanced as it gets in Suave. That's like the beautiful part of it. It doesn't get that much harder than this. And we could also use, of course, we instead of getting an error, we can just uh, not found. Uh, combinator, what? And that's in the. Uh, I would actually get if I use if I was using Visual Studio, I would get some some kind of intelligence helping me uh, adding these uh, modules. Um, but it's not that hard to figure out 
by yourself. And I'd like to. Why don't we use this fish as an operator for the KML3? For which one? For the KML3. Yeah, the question was why don't we do the fish bone operator for Hello3? Uh, that's basically um, the pass scan operator uh, must take a function in that accepts those two arguments. If I was adding one more argument here, um, yeah, then I have to have one more here basically to make it compile. And you can't do that with the fishbone operator since the fishbone operator operates on, on web parts, but the pass scan uh, needs to have a function accepting that format. And now we also have a, a not found part. So this should actually work now because, yeah, I added that part. But if I have a string here, it doesn't work because it's bound to an integer. Uh, Okay, so let's do some more uh, like relevant stuff. Uh, Can you make this parameters optional as well? Uh, true, that was a good question. I don't think actually you can do that, not with the path scan at least. Uh, it would be quite hard because what does it mean if maybe this parameter would be optional? Uh, that, that would be, so I, would, I would actually think say no when I think that's a good thing. Uh, if you want an optional parameter, there should probably be a, a query parameter instead of something in the route, um, since that's, yeah. And then it can be optional. Um, so let's apply some logging to this uh, uh, application. Uh, uh, this is too much code for me to, to write all by myself, so I'll cheat again. But it's not that much code. I have, yeah, 13 lines of code, something like that, I think. Um, this is my simple logging framework. Uh, you can imagine that this is a logging framework that would uh, print things to maybe some analytic server or whatever. But I'm just going to print it to, to the console instead. And the way it works is first, I have a function called log, which basically uh, print something to the console, and then just return uh, a new web part. And then I also have some helper functions to, to log time, to log a URL, and then I have two other helper functions to log start time and end time, just to, uh, that also use the log time helper functions. Uh, and then the actual combinator, so th this is the, this is, how you actually would implement a, a combinator yourself, basically. And the combinator here is, is uh, log request. And this combinator takes a web part as input. And then we're going to start with the log in the time, log URL, and then uh, execute the web part that was passed into it. And then it's going to log the end time of that request. Uh, and the reason I have error here is because the uh, compiler doesn't know what this type should be yet. So I, I can help it out like that. I, I didn't have to because I know I'm going to use it later and then the compiler will figure out the type of it. Uh, and to use this web part, this is basically, if you remember from the slide, we have the whole big web part at the end. This is what we get got here. But now I can start wrapping this into other web parts or combinators. So now if I do logging, log request, uh, that's all we need to do to add logging for every request in our application. Uh, I'm actually going to do that on the console because it's easier to see. So I'm going to stop it here first and then run here instead. So now I should have got some logging. Yeah, start request at some time and to a URL. And if I go to hello2, I get a new request. OK, so that's good. But now let's say we want to extend this uh, logging thing to also supply. Um, it might be a little bit hard to actually track uh, track the request in this logging. 
let's say we, we have a, a sleep in this request that take, takes some while. Uh, and now we run uh, hello2 and hello1. It's a little bit hard to know exactly which, which request ended when. Uh, so add, let's add a, a request ID to everything. Uh, and we start with the logging function. Now it's going to take a request ID as input. We print out the request ID and uh, the compiler says is something is wrong. So let's add the request ID. ID, probably here too. And as you see, uh, F sharp is uh, sort of uh, nice to me in, in the sense that it tells me exactly what to do in the compiler. And I don't have to add this parameter to all the functions as well because I'm using parse applications to build up the structure. So if I don't provide all parameters in a function call, I'm just going to get a new function back. Uh, and see, log URL doesn't have a request ID parameter, so I have to add it there. Okay. This thing might seem <laughs> like a easy thing to do, but I wanted to show this because uh, there's a bug in this. Uh, you see, every request got the same uh, request ID. And uh, does anyone maybe know why? Or you want me to tell them? Uh, the thing is that this, this log request thing only execute once. And, and that means we got the, the request ID only the first time. And then it returned this web part. And this web part is what's used every single time. And the request ID was already bound at that time. And to uh, fix this, we could either do as we do up here, take in the context as a parameter to the function. It makes it, uh, then we can actually handle it ourselves. Or we can use one of three helper functions in Suave. One that's called uh, Warbler, I don't know actually what that does. Uh, the other two are context or request. Uh, and the context and request are almost the same. All those three are basically the same thing. Uh, but they are, um, the request is working on the request object, while the context is working on the uh, context uh, property as input to the to function. Uh, I really don't need the, the value, so I can just say that this is going to be a, a value I don't care about. That's why I'm providing underscore. Uh, and now this is going to return a web part that's executed for each request. And we should now get a new request ID for each request. And that worked. So. That's how you apply a cross-carting concern in a Swell application. That could also be uh, like authentication, would be probably as easy as adding uh, logging. And I could actually apply this to, to just a part of the application if I wanted to. I could do it there, I think. So if I call hello2 now, we wouldn't get any new uh, any new request, but if I call this one here, I should get some logging part. So th this is the the, comp the composability part of Suave and F Sharp in action. It's really easy to just move around pieces and and, and put things together to to build a whole application. So let's do something that's uh, more real. Uh, I was thinking about doing a small, uh, sort of stupid web application that's going to take an input of a city and a date and return the population of the country for that city that year and the temperature <laughs> that day. That makes sense, right? Um, so let's see, see if we can manage to do that in less than 20 minutes. It should be quite doable. 
So first we need to uh, add uh, some serialization helpers. So I'm going to use uh, Newton Charts JSON. And we also need to use F sharp data, which is a um, data library in F sharp that has a lot of uh, type providers. I'm not going to go into detail what type provider is. I'm just going to use them here and, and, and show you how it works, basically. So let's add these two. Wait, I get. Uh, that's working fine. Uh, and the first thing I need to do is actually add some references. This is just the loading the DLLs uh, for me. And uh, just, no, it's not that fun to, uh, to mention. Um, that's what you need to do to both have uh, JSON.NET and, and NetWrap data in scope. So the first thing is we do add a j simple JSON helper that handles uh, uh, JSON response and and uh, requests. Uh, this is actually the reason I use the alpha bits of Suave because this part map JSON with was not in the 1.0 bit. So that's something I submitted to them a couple of months back. Uh, and this is how you. Uh, add a serializer for uh, JSON in in Suave. Um, first, I take something that uh, encode bytes from. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important to be consistent. Call things to UTF and then ask if to be sure. Uh, and then I have two, have two helper functions. One is deserialize and one is serialize. And the map JSON with takes those two functions as input creating a new uh, a new web part that's uh, going to take a JSON request and return a JSON response. And this is something I'm going to do when I now implement my API. So let's create a temp pop API. Temp pop stands for temperature population API. Um, I think it's the first thing I need to have some types. Uh, the weather type here is something I get from the JSON provider, it's F-sharp type provider. And uh, this is a sample request that returns uh, some kind of response. I don't exactly know, exactly know what. Uh, and then I also use the World Bank data, which is also from the F-sharp data library. So these are two type providers. Uh, that, that generate the types for me while I'm actually developing. And then I have this uh, request type here. I want to have a string as input and a date time as input to, to my API. Uh, and I'm going to return the request to see, yeah, I want to return the request, uh, the temperature, uh, the population, and the country. Everything here is optional because you, you don't, if you ask for 2016, you don't get a response for population because we don't have the stats for 2016 yet. I don't think you actually have it for 2015 in the World Bank data either. Uh, so let's implement the population function. Uh, get them. Population. Uh, this is probably the most advanced thing I'm going to show you. Uh, the population take a, uh, a response object and check the country and also check the year of the of the um, of the date to actually go and then uh, ask the World Bank data for the stats for that year. So World Bank data have uh, the type right here has some really awesome things. So here I can navigate through this is like real time going through the the API to the World Bank data and looking at all the countries in the world. And I can navigate through here and, and find some uh, nice stats about each country. So what I'm doing is uh, first finding the country I'm interested in. Uh, and if I did find a country, I'm looking up the indicators for the population total. Uh, 
if I found, found that population indicator, I'm just going to set the population to, to the result here. So that was the population part. And the next part would be the, uh, the temperature. Uh, this is a little bit easier. Uh, here I'm using exactly the same type provider as here, but this was a sample request. And now I need to uh, actually, th this should be a percent S, yeah, there it is. <laughs> so that, that's the parameter to, uh, to the, the function I'm using. And I, I, you can see it up here somewhere, here I'm using Oslo instead. So that's how I figured out how that API worked. Um, so just doing the request for that URL, and I got get the weather API, and the response object looks something like this. It is something that F sharp type provider generated for me. And then I just converting it to Celsius because I don't <laughs> have no idea what Fahrenheit is. Um, and I also extract the country from this, from this response, actually, and using this later on to get the, the population. And to put these things together, uh, we need to have the, I think that's the function, yeah. So here I'm using the, the previous JSON helper, uh, the map JSON net function. And it said it takes a response object, which now has a signature of get temp pop. And that's uh, what the, the helper function has here do for us. And the uh, F sharp um, type system help us with to figure out. And then I start with an initial response, setting the request to be equal to R, and setting everything else to none. And then I just pipe this response or response through those two functions, filling, uh, filling out the data that uh, I found in, in, the, in the request. Uh, and to add this here, we need to do a, I think it's path, API, temp pop, I think. Mm. And here, of course, uh, I need to do not. Where is Postman? Here's Postman. So response should look something like this. And if I'm lucky, this should work right away. It did, yes. So uh, this date was 8 degrees Celsius, I think. And uh, population in 2014 was 5 million people in Norway. And uh, that is. It was all there is to it, basically, like 50 lines of code, maybe, uh, to uh, ask two APIs, parse all the data, and get the result, result back from them, and also plug things in. There's one thing more I can show you, and that's, let's say that we only want to use uh, post, as we do. We do post here, uh, but this should probably work with get. It doesn't make sense because you shouldn't get data this way. Um, but let's do a post instead. Only support post. And that's this is how you do this in, in Suave. So now you're telling this. This route should only support, uh, support the post uh, action. So if I'm trying to get data, I should get some kind of what? because this doesn't exist. And back to post, it should work. Yeah, I think that was all for my demos. So let's have a short summary. Um, so the first part is F sharp is awesome. I uh, hope you saw that and um, f feel that you're a little bit interested in, in trying this out. Um, of course, I, I was only using the scripting part because I wanted to prototype and show things out. But it's not that hard to actually move this to a console application uh, if you want to. But you can actually host the script application 
if you want as well. There, there are examples of that hosting F -sharp script applications in Azure websites, for example. Uh, or you can run it in Docker. Um, but um, yeah, depending on how large application is, uh, you should probably use a compiled application. But for prototyping and trying things out, it's really easy to get started with a console application or, or a script environment and, and just write those three or four lines of code and you're up and running. And the next thing is the web is functional, as everyone agreed on. Uh, so try to program the web using a functional language because it is functional. Uh, if you want to know more, there are some resources here. Here you have uh, Suave. Uh, there's, you can always go to GitHub and look at the code. It's not that advanced code, actually. Uh, if you have any question how a combinator works, it's almost easier to go look at the combinator in the, in the code than actually trying to read the documentation. Uh, and there's a free book on GitBook. That's a great introduction to Java as well. That I took a lot of inspiration from. Uh, and all my calls, code samples are in the last repo over there. Uh, it's a kind of mess on that <laughs> repo, but the code is there at least. Uh, before I take questions, uh, the next talk in this room is going to be Scott Flashing. He's going to talk about parsing. I guess that's going to be even more advanced than my talk. Uh, so please stick around for that. And there is also on the pitch is the lab hour that is right after lunch, where you can come and uh, ask questions for all the functional speakers here at the conference. And with that, any questions? No? Hosting in IIS. Uh, excuse me, what? Hosting in IIS, is that possible? Hosting in IIS uh, was a question. I think that, that that should be should be possible, but not the same way as you do with ASP.NET. Uh, because the, the example that I think it was Scott Hanselman who did it together with Thomas Petrushek, hosting the script application on uh, Azure website. And that is actually running IIS on the hood, I guess. So uh, you can fire up uh, EXE and host that in, in IIS process. But I, I would rather actually run it just as a console application. I, I did a small performance benchmark to uh, against Suave, against the .NET Core bits on Kestrel, and it's roughly the same uh, performance-wise on my machine it is. I didn't do a, a huge performance benchmark, but uh, I don't think it is a good reason to use IS for that. Maybe I should probably use like Nginx or something else on top of, of Suave instead of IS. Any other questions? Yeah. I, I think I would actually, if, if you're using internally, in, in then you, it might be fine. But for public, I would probably put it by, behind Nginx or HAProx or something like that. The question was if it's safe to expose Suave to the public. And of course, you can, but I would probably put it behind a proxy. Yeah, yeah up there. So the comment was that there is our, it's also a product called WebSharper that you can use together or separately uh, with Suave. That gives you some more, more stuff basically, a little bit high, more high, le high level than Suave. Any more questions? No? Then thank you.